Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us for this important symposium. As all of you know, we're in the middle of a crisis, and crises require leadership and action. And I'm so pleased that we have leaders here at Penn Medicine who are helping us lead the way with this important battle. You'll remember on March the 12th, the announcement by the World Health Organization that we had entered a pandemic. On that same day, our chief scientific officer, John Epstein, announced the creation of a new center at Penn. This is the Center for the Coronavirus Research. Dr. Epstein asked two of our leaders, Dr. Susan Weiss and Dr. Rick Bushman, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Weiss later on, to co-lead this center. And they immediately reached out to their faculty colleagues, most of whom didn't work in this area, but wanted to run towards the crisis and help out. So I couldn't be more proud of Penn Medicine. We've worked hard to build an infrastructure to translate basic discovery into practical clinical treatments. We call this translational research. We've been prepared to do uh, this kind of work quickly and you see the Penn Medicine team stepping into action as we face this crisis. So I'm now going to hand things over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Susan Weiss. Dr. Weiss has been studying coronavirus for decades. She trained with a Nobel laureate and has been studying viruses her entire career. She's like superwoman. She not only studies this virus, but she's led our postdoctoral program, she's led our programs on inclusion and diversity, and now she's a co-director of this center. Uh, Dr. Weiss, let me hand things over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jameson, and welcome everybody uh, to our symposium. I'm gonna give a brief introduction to Dr. Ronald Coleman, who's the speaker this morning. Um, as Dr. Jameson said, Dr. Coleman is the professor of medicine in the pulmonary and critical care a division. He's also a professor of microbiology and the director of the Center for AIDS Research. And in, in these capacities, uh, Ron, Dr. Coleman has been an active clinician and also really active member of the virology community. So during this uh, recent outbreak, he's become also an active, very active member in several capacities of, um, of our center. He's caring for uh, COVID ID uh, 19 patients in the hospital, and at the same time, He's played a major role in helping um, Dr. Bushman and I establish the Center for Coronavirus Research. In addition, he's playing a central role in organizing research efforts that are developing in the university and the health systems very rapidly. So um, with that introduction, I'm going to give it over to, uh, to Dr. Coleman. And just remember that at the end, there's gonna be some time for questions and answers. So Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, thank all of you for being here. Um, I hope you and your families and your loved ones are well, uh, healthy, safe, and managing in this extraordinarily stressful time. What I want to do is tell you a bit about the virus, a bit about the disease it causes and the treatments that we have, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Penn Medicine is doing to meet the crisis both clinically, but really more focused on the new knowledge that we're trying to gain that we need to improve detection, treatment, prevention, and patient care for all people affected by, infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. There'll be time for questions at the end. Um, let me first say that uh, there's more unknown than there is known. I'll do my best to be clear about what scientific solid knowledge and what is best guess, but be sure that some of the answers will be different a week from now. The situation is moving quickly. Physicians and scientists are sharing knowledge and data across the country, across the globe, and uh, comparing experience. So let me go to the slides here and uh, share my screen. So let me start uh, at the very beginning. What is a virus? So pathogens are microorganisms that can cause disease. 
And there are a number of different categories of pathogens. Uh, some examples are bacteria, and some of the diseases that we're familiar with that are caused by bacteria might be typical pneumonia. There are many different bacteria. One of the most common one is pneumococcus, strep throat, which is caused by the streptococcus, most urinary tract infections, and many skin infections. There are pathogens that are fungi as well. For example, oral thrush is caused by the fungus candida, and some skin infections are fungal as well. And then there are a number of infections caused by protozoan pathogens. Probably the most well-known one is malaria. And what these all have to share is that these are all living organisms. Bacteria, fungi, and protozoa are living entities. In contrast, viruses, which include HIV, the cause of AIDS, cold sores, or fever blisters that are caused by the herpes simplex virus, and the common cold that's caused by a number of different viruses. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Viruses require a host cell in which to replicate. And that actually makes them quite different from the living organisms, bacteria, fungi, and protozoa, because they mainly use all of the functions of the host cell in order to replicate. So they basically take over the host cell. They commandeer its activity. So what is the coronavirus? So why the name? It's named for uh, the apparent, its, a, its appearance in an electron mic micrograph that you can see up here on the right. It has an appearance that looks like a crown or a halo. And so there are many, many species of animals that have coronaviruses. Mice, pigs, bats, cats, other species. They can cause lung disease, liver disease, brain disease, gastrointestinal disease, and some of them cause no disease at all. So how about human coronaviruses? Well, until recently, all we knew about human coronaviruses is that they cause the common cold. And so I, I, I want to just digress here for a moment and say, this is one of the important points about basic research. So um, why would somebody study coronaviruses that infect mice, pigs, bats, other species, and in humans only cause the common cold? Well, that's what we call basic research, trying to understand fundamental principles that may be not be obviously co co connected to a major human disease, but this is how we establish the fundamentals that down the line become important for us to have. And I'll circle back to this later, because I think we're really fortunate to have had Dr. Susan Weiss working on coronavirus the last number of decades, so that when the human diseases emerged, we have that basic research available. So the first severe disease caused by a coronavirus only appeared first in 2002, and that was named Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, and it emerged through what we call a zoonotic transmission, an animal-to-human transmission. So this concept of animal-to-human transmission among viruses really is nothing new at all. For example, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, originated in monkeys that was then transmitted to chimpanzees that then jumped to humans probably about 100 years ago. And that's a path that was worked out by Dr. Beatrice Hahn here at Penn. Influenza. Well, we all know of influenza as a human virus, but why do we hear about things like the swine flu? Well, each year, influenza changes slightly, but every once in a while, the influenza virus in humans gets mixed up with the influenza virus that comes from birds or comes from pigs, and then a piece of the influenza virus gets swapped in, and all of a sudden, there's a big change in the virus, and that's when we have a severe influenza epidemic. And that's work that Dr. Scott Hensley here has been working on for many years. So the concept of a zoonotic transmission, animal to human, actually is nothing new and no great surprise. So how about coronavirus? Well, it all starts with the bat. Bats, it turns out, 
have many coronaviruses. And I'm not sure we know why bats have so many coronaviruses, but they've been the origin for all three zoonotic transmissions of coronaviruses into humans that I'm going to go through in a minute. But again, this is another point why basic research is so important. You might ask, well, you, maybe you saw a headline somewhere that said, maybe derisively saying, this investigator got federal funds to study viruses in bats. Someone might wonder, why are we spending money to study viruses in bats? Well, this is the reason. So the first SARS epidemic, as we've learned from a great deal of research, originated from transmission from the bat into a, a mammal called a palm civet. And then in 2002, we had an epidemic that reached 8,000 cases, almost 800 deaths. And that was fortunately curtailed after uh, a year or so through aggressive public health uh, approaches. Then in 2012, we discovered MERS coronavirus, and that's named for Middle East respiratory virus. And what we learned is that that had been transmitted likely through a camel intermediary that initially appeared in 2012. There are still some sporadic cases, and that's resulted in uh, about 2,500 cases and about 8, 850 deaths through follow-up person-to-person transmission. And SARS-CoV-2, named for the severe acute respiratory system syndrome, covirus 2 that we think, we don't know the definitive answer, but we think also was transmitted through a mammal called a pangolin. I never heard of a pangolin until this epidemic uh, 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 developed, but uh, this is what it apparently looks like. And so we all know what the consequence of this is. This is from the Johns Hopkins uh, Coronavirus COVID-19 Global Case website. I think many of you have probably looked at this dashboard. This is the uh, data for the United States as of yesterday afternoon, almost a quarter of a million cases identified, over 5,000 deaths. So what's the clinical disease caused by this virus? And let me just say SARS-CoV-2 is what we call the virus. COVID-19 is what we call the disease. So this is uh, evolving knowledge. We're learning more as time goes on. We're learning things from the epidemic in the United States that maybe uh, are concordant with what's been learned in China. Some things maybe are a little bit different. What we think is that the incubation period is about five days on average between exposure to symptoms, sometimes as short as two days, sometimes as long as two weeks. However, recent data shows that people can shed virus for several days before symptoms appear. We don't know how common that is. And some people can be infected and have no symptoms at all. And we also don't know how common that is. And of course, that's a real concern or uh, public health approaches to curtail the epidemic. There's obviously been a lot of discussion that everybody has uh, 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 been reading in the newspapers about how best to curtail the epidemic. That really is based upon our current knowledge of how transmission occurs, and that's transmission by droplets. That's microscopic bits of phlegm, saliva, or mucus that's produced when somebody who's shedding virus coughs sneezes, or even speaks. And so infection is acquired by droplets landing on the mouth, the nose, the eyes, or hands that have touched such droplets and then touch the mouth, nose, and eyes. That's why the emphasis is social distancing to prevent that person-to-person -person transmission of droplets, hand washing to ensure that things that you touch uh, don't then uh, touch your own mouth nose, and eyes. What we know so far, transmission probably is not occurring through actual aerosol aerosolization into the uh, smaller droplets, but that's a concern when people are on ventilators in the hospital, for example, where aerosols are created through the uh, mechanical ventilatory system. 
So um, why is SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 so severe? You know, we've all heard a lot of comparisons to um, influenza. And is this really any worse than influenza? And I think we all know the answer is yes, it's worse than influenza. So it's clearly very easily transmissible. Maybe one of the most important things is that it's a new virus, so there's no pre-existing immunity. We've all been exposed to influenza in the past. We've all had rounds of influenza vaccination. And so each time a new influenza strain comes along, we may not have complete immunity, but we're not completely naked against it. SARS-CoV-2, we've never seen it before. And for all we know, maybe it's actually a more dangerous, a more virulent virus. So the symptoms can range from mild to severe. And as I said, some people can be infected and have no symptoms at all. It's more likely to be severe in people who are older, have high blood pressure, diabetes, or heart or lung disease. But I'll tell you that data comes mainly from China and Italy and the very early experience that we're having in Philadelphia that uh, I got a report on yesterday from colleagues who are working in our hospitals is that a substantial proportion of our patients in the hospital and in Philadelphia are not elderly. In New York, about 40%, my understanding is less than 65. In Philadelphia, we seem to be having 40%, even less than the age of 40. So uh, this is um, an evolving situation. The initial symptoms can be vague, but they progress over several days, and eventually nearly everyone develops fever, usually fatigue, cough, often muscle aches, and then more severe disease progresses to shortness of breath, pneumonia, and respiratory failure. So these are three CAT scans. A CAT scan is a type of x-ray uh, that is essentially looking as though you were able to take a slice through the body. And so this is a normal CAT scan on the left. In the lungs, black is good, it's air. White is tissue. And so here's the heart, here's the bones and the soft tissue, the spine. This is a normal CAT scan full of nice black lung tissue. This is mild disease. You can see mild pneumonia caused by the virus. And then this is severe disease where you see so much of the lung is filled up with this white material uh, that is not supposed to be there. But in any risk group, we don't know why some people have mild or even no symptoms and why some people get severe disease. And that's a really important research question that we have to understand so we can figure out what might be responsible for determining who gets severe disease. So treatment. Honest truth is right now, treatment is mainly supportive care. Most people can remain at home, rest, control fever, isolation to prevent transmission. For hospitalized patients, we provide general supportive care, IV fluids, oxygen, and close monitoring in case someone worsens. But then if respiratory failure develops, and that usually is in this, in the, in the, with the presentation of what we call acute adult respiratory distress syndrome, they require ventilator support. And I'll just as an aside mention that 10 critical care researchers have been leaders over the last decade or two in developing the current optimal treatments for ARDS through ventilator support. So we really have the best treatments available to maximize our ability to support people on mechanical ventilators. And then of course, we treat complications, heart, liver, kidney complications, and bacterial superinfection. When someone has a viral infection, they may be more susceptible to getting bacterial infections. That's very common with influenza. We don't know whether that's really the case for uh, COVID-19. So let me turn to some of the questions that I think people are really interested in. Antiviral drugs. We need antiviral drugs to block or slow down the virus so that the immune system can get the upper hand. And the two drugs that probably most of you have heard about or read about are hydroxychloroquine. That's around, that's been around for as a treatment for lupus. 
In the laboratory, it blocks virus entry into cells, but things that work in the laboratory don't always work in people. And another drug called remdesivir that was developed to block replication of viruses inside cells, that was developed for Ebola, although it didn't turn out to be the optimal therapy uh, for Ebola. But the bottom line is we don't know if these drugs actually work. So these antiviral drugs, if they work, this is not like somebody has a urinary tract infection with a bacteria, you take an antibiotic, the antibiotic kills the bacteria, and in a couple of days, 98% of the time, it's all gone, you're better. Or bacterial pneumonia, where an antibiotic is pretty darn good at killing the bacteria, and then the body can clear up. If these drugs work, and we don't know if they do, the benefit is assuredly only modest. These are not slam drunk, these are not slam dunk virus killers. And so novel treatments need to be developed in addition to figuring out if these drugs actually really do have benefit. So I wanna pivot now and tell you about the clinical care response to COVID-19 at Penn Medicine. And, and, and uh, if you have any questions on what I've presented, please use the Q&A column uh, in your sidebar. So there's been a huge effort here, and this has really occupied a, a, a tremendous cross-team, cross-disciplinary -discipl initiative. So all outpatient appointments, except for emergencies and critical appointments are transitioned to telemedicine. We've had about a two-thirds decrease in hospital admissions and procedures to create space for the current coming surge that we're beginning to see of COVID patients. The new pavilion that you could see down in the corner of your screen that's under construction, the health system accelerated uh, construction to ready 120 bed space. Even before the building is open, we'll be able to have the opportunity to move in if we needed 120 extra patients. A general medicine surge unit was opened in our Rittenhouse facility. So we wanna be sure we're ready for the COVID-19 patients, and we wanna be sure we're gonna be able to continue to provide optimal care for all our other patients as well. Multiple critical care beds in the hospital have been transitioned to COVID-19 units, while at the same time maintaining capacity to care for the non-COVID patients. Facilities work 24 seven to create negative airflow in multiple areas for increased safety. As I mentioned, droplet is how the virus normally spreads. But when somebody is on a ventilator, that has the potential to create aerosols, which is a risk for healthcare personnel. Negative pressure rooms help with that. And non-traditional areas of the hospital have been readied, if needed, to be turned into additional uh, care units. And the system has worked hard to procure additional ventilators. There's been a massive education and readiness program, team reorganization. Our clinical lab worked day and night to establish rapid in-house testing, now running on a number of different platforms. The epidemic was uh, really hampered by the absence of testing. And so we relied on our own clinical lab to get that up and going. We have drive-through testing sites and we have screening unit tents in front of the emergency room. All employees get a daily temperature check and there's a full-time mask policy. There's been tremendous distribution of personal protective equipment and training. Research labs across the Penn schools have donated thousands of items of personal protective equipment. And just as one example out of many types of collaborations, our engineering school is working on 3D printing various personal protective items. So I wanna show you what one of our COVID-19 units looks like. This is um, one of our uh, frontline healthcare providers in what's called a PAPR. This is a personal protective device where there is a filtered airflow that goes through this helmet here. She has a battery pack that runs the airflow. It gets HEPA filtered. She's 
about to go into the room to provide care to the patient. This is one of our new COVID-19 units. I took this photo yesterday afternoon. So what's the research response? So you've heard a little bit about the Penn Center for Research on Coronavirus and Other Emerging Pathogens. And so this is a centralized entity to bring together investigators to um, collaborate and to develop shared resources to address this epidemic. I want to take you through a few different areas of research and uh, um, perhaps give you my perspective on why I think that these are important, how they may impact patient care, uh, and um, why we are pursuing them. And again, there'll be a chance for questions later. Let me start off by um, talking about basic research. I mentioned this previously. And, um, you know, sometimes basic research isn't appreciated by the public. Why study a virus in bats? Why study the common cold? Why learn about coronavirus? So here we have Dr. Weiss, one of the world's leaders in coronaviruses, because she stuck with basic research. And much of what we know about coronaviruses has come out of the work that she's done over many years. So what are some of the questions that this basic research can help us answer and what she's working on? She'll be talking uh, this afternoon, and you'll hear in more detail uh, uh, in the scientific presentation. But what are the questions that we need to ask using basic research? How does SARS-CoV-2 differ from other coronaviruses? What makes it so much more dangerous? Why is it different from the common cold? So antiviral drugs target the virus. They target proteins made by genes in the virus. Are there new genes or proteins that we can identify in the virus that could be targets for new drugs? And can we find viral genes or proteins that are present not just in this virus, but maybe across other coronaviruses that could be drug targets not just for SARS-CoV-2, but maybe for the next one that's going to emerge? And who knows when it will be? Who knows where it will be? But we need to be ready for the next one to emerge. Um, this is how we depict the genome of a virus. Uh, this is its uh, RNA sequence. It's 30,000 bases of RNA long. And this is a fluorescence micrograph that Dr. Weiss took in her laboratory of coronavirus growing in cells. So we don't know why some people get severe disease and others don't. There are many, many, many people working on this here. Um, one question is related to the microbiome. So the microbiome, many of you have probably heard talked about. The microbiome is the entirety of bacteria, fungi, and other viruses that normally inhabit the human body and influence many inflammatory and infectious diseases. So does the type of microbiome that somebody has affect the disease severity? And if it does, can we manipulate it to change that? And then on the flip side of that, we know that in influenza, most deaths are actually due to bacterial superinfection that takes root in lungs damaged by the flu virus. Does this happen with COVID-19? Could we predict it by tracking the lung microbiome and prevent it? How about genetics? Are there genetic differences that determine who gets mild disease, who gets severe disease, or I should add, who gets no symptoms at all, even though they're infected by the virus? And we have a number of groups here working on genetics that have worked in cancer, infectious diseases. They're now pivoted to study COVID-19 genetics. And I would mention that uh, the microbiome area is the uh, area of focus that my lab, in collaboration with Dr. Rick Bushman, is focused on. We need to figure out whether these available drugs that everybody talks about as though they are miracle cures, do they really work? Does hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir actually have benefit? So 
in a number of different studies led by Dr. Ian Frank here, we have multiple clinical trials in different groups of patients that are in place to test if the drugs really do have benefit. Can we use these drugs to protect the healthcare workforce? We have a study gearing up to determine whether hydroxychloroquine can prevent infection in frontline healthcare workers. Keeping our healthcare workforce healthy is one of the most critical things that we can do. The problems experienced in New York, in Italy, it's not only the huge surge of patients, it's also the loss of frontline healthcare workers through patient to healthcare worker transmission. And hopefully this study will show us whether this is a feasible way to protect our frontline healthcare workers. I'll mention another study that's just in its conceptualization phase, but I suspect that there are people who are uh, listening in who might be on uh, these drugs. So SARS-CoV-2 uses a protein on cells called ACE2 as the pathway, its receptor, to get inside. It turns out that this particular protein is also the target of two of the most commonly used drugs for hypertension and heart disease, ARBs and ACE inhibitors. But we don't know, do these drugs affect the course of the disease? Is it better to stay on them if you're already on them? Or is it better to stop them if you're on them and you have COVID-19? There are theoretical reasons why it might be good to be on these drugs, theoretical reasons it might be bad to be on the drug. We need research to figure out what the answer is. And so this study will help us understand what's the best way to be treating our patients. So developing new drug therapies. You know, I, I, I've already made the point that the drugs we currently have available, they're not gonna be slam dunk. So maybe it's gonna turn out we need another fabulous drug. Maybe it's gonna turn out that we need to have multiple drugs. That's what we learned for the treatment of HIV AIDS. You need to have multiple drugs used simultaneously. And for that, we have great treatment now, but it took a long time. We don't have the time right now. So are there drugs that are already in use for other purposes that might block the virus? It takes a long time to um, start from uh, a chemical, go all the way to finding activity against the target, then determine whether it can be given to humans. Is it safe? How long does it last? But if we can find a drug that's already in use for other purposes, where we know about its safety, we know how often to give it, we know how to give it, that would be a great jump start. So we have, under the uh, leadership of Dr. Sarah Cherry, where we have a high throughput drug screening program that will screen all existing drugs and related chemicals for anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity. And boy, if we can find something that has activity that already is a drug, we're way ahead of the game in terms of getting something into our patients. Vaccines is another area where Penn is really among the leaders in the world. And I would say the particular approach that has really been pioneered in our community is using nucleic acid vaccines to generate an immune response. So the usual vaccines, the typical vaccines, we either uh, take a virus and kill it with chemicals and use an inactivated virus, or the virus is grown and modified to make it weaker, so we use uh, an attenuated virus. Or for some types of vaccines like hepat hepatitis B, we just use a protein, and those are injected. It takes a long time to get there, to make the virus, to inactivate the virus, to make the proteins. Instead, the nucleic acids are actually the instructions that tell a cell what to make. So instead of delivering those particles or, or proteins, can we have the body actually make the immunizing material? And the great thing about this is it's faster to create, cheaper, 
and easier to scale than traditional vaccines. And we have leaders in two, both types of nucleic acid vaccines here. DNA vaccines, really uh, pioneered by Dr. David Weiner. Uh, the vaccine has been generated, the stock is ready. A phase one study of safety and immunogenicity has been approved and first study subjects will be enrolled next week. RNA vaccines is a newer approach, been pioneered here by Dr. Drew Weissman and his colleague, Dr. Norbert Party. Both uh, Dr. Weiner and Dr. Party will be speaking this afternoon. This is a really novel approach and creates rapid and strong immune responses. And if you're interested, tune in this afternoon, you'll hear about these really cool approaches and how rapidly they're moving forward. We have a new protocol that is um, uh, just about ready to be approved. Question is, can antibodies from people who have recovered from COVID-19 be effective to treat severe disease? This is not a new concept. This is a concept that was developed many years ago um, in the era before we had good uh, uh, drugs for many infections, before we had a lot of vaccines. It's called passive immunotherapy. And so you collect plasma from a confirmed recovered patient. It's gonna be two weeks after recovery. And that plasma is infused into sick patients with the hope that that plasma will control the infection and improve the outcome. That study is gearing up and I think it shouldn't be very long until it's actually launched. The um, program to recruit donors has already been launched and I've put up on the screen the website uh, for donor registry. So anyone who has recovered from COVID-19 and is interested in being uh, uh, considered as a potential plasma donor for passive immunotherapy, go to this website, put in your information and uh, uh, we appreciate your um, interest in contributing both to science and the care of our patients. So I want to um, just end up by uh, showing you a couple of pictures of um, how some of this research works. And of course, I'm gonna stick with the research that my group does. So here we see um, on the left, samples being collected from patients via a seamless integration of clinical and research goals. I took all these pictures on Wednesday, two days ago. This is uh, a frontline healthcare provider. This is one of our uh, critical care physicians entering a patient's room. You could see him dressed up in his personal protective equipment, a PAPR. Um, the frontline healthcare workers collect respiratory specimens for us. Those specimens are then transported by the research team to the biosafety level three laboratory. You can see in the center, this is controlled by retinal scanning or uh, uh, controlled access. Here we have those samples that within a couple of hours have been processed, plated onto cells, RNA extracted, and are beginning the process. And here we have Dr. Um, Henry Lee, who you'll be hearing from this afternoon, and one of his colleagues uh, carrying these specimens from uh, their processing station to uh, the incubator. What we're gonna learn from this is gonna feed back and impact our clinical care. The goal is to rapidly develop, test, validate, and implement new ways to improve diagnosis, treatment, patient care, and prevention. And so across the spectrum of clinical to research and back to clinical is uh, how we do this process. So I'll end up here um, by just mentioning a few things that I think are really uh, key and critical uh, to our research mission uh, from basic to translational to clinical research. And that's to provide expert clinical care for patients with COVID-19 to make sure that we have proactive preparedness for the oncoming surge. We have an incredible community of world-class researchers in virology, immunology, infectious disease, pulmonary and critical care medicine, and they have come together over the last several weeks 
like I could not even have imagined with interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary calls multiple times a day, uh, rapid review and discussion of research initiatives, and a clear commitment from everyone up and down the line that every single one of our patients is going to have the opportunity to be enrolled in a trial to try and find the optimal treatments. Integration across basic clinical and translational research. The shared mission between our clinical and our research faculty. Everyone has the same mission. And then something I'm not going to really talk about is the fact that Penn has an incredible experience with concept to drug or product pipeline. I think most people listening uh, are probably familiar with um, the groundbreaking cell-based immunotherapy for cancer and the complexities involved with bringing that entirely new branch of therapeutics forward, led by Dr. Carl June. And the experience that was learned in that has really made movement concept to drug or product uh, uh, one of the uh, most expert areas uh, that we can provide here. So with that, I want to thank you. Um, there'll be time. I think we have about uh, 12 minutes for questions. I have some contact information up here. Uh, Megan Ostaff, Torin Blair, and anyone is, of course, welcome to contact me. I'm on the Penn, Web Penn, Penn Medicine website. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we have time for some questions now, as Dr. Coleman said. So let me answer. Let me ask and answer the first question that got the most the most likes on the question um, tab. Uh, people want to know whether the symposium is going to be recorded and available. And yes, it will be recorded and will be available next week. So uh, another the question that was asked uh, many times uh, was: Is it okay to go outside to jog outdoors on a trail? Um, and a related question, when people are outside, should they be wearing PPE? So, um, yes, it's fine to go outside and jog on a trail. Um, stay six feet away from people or further. Um, and, uh, you know, really, the, the key is there, there, there are three reasons that um, social distancing is important. One is for you to decrease the likelihood that you're going to acquire an infection. Stay six, weeks, six, six feet away from other people. Two is if you are infected and don't know it, decrease the likelihood that you're going to transmit it to somebody else. And then three is at the public health level, the more effectively we decrease the nodes of transmission, the slower this will spread within our communities. So go out. If you're going to be uh, near other people, the number one thing is to avoid it. So first I would say um, don't use personal protective equipment that is going to take it away from a healthcare provider. They have real risks. We don't know whether PPE, whether wearing a mask, whether wearing eye shields will really have a major effect for the general public. But I'm going to tell you something that is what we call data free. So we don't have any data on this. But what I would do is if I had a mask available, I probably would wear it if I'm going to be interacting with other people. I think it's not going to hurt. I think maybe it would prevent some droplets from coming out of the mouth to uh, be transmitted to surfaces or to be transmitted to other people. Um, I think it's unlikely to be harmful unless it gives somebody a false sense of security and it makes them think that they can have closer contact than they should uh, really, that would be my advice. Okay, another popular question was uh, a concern about the virus being transmitted to pets, dogs, cats, et cetera. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's another data, it's another data free area. Um, you know, uh, there have been reports uh, that uh, have come out in the last, you know, week or so about isolating a virus from dogs, uh, about isolating it from cats, I'd say we don't know. Um, let me just point out that the fact that you can isolate RNA from a virus, from a substance or, or a source, doesn't mean that that's a potential source of transmission. So um, I wish I had all the answers. I don't. 
I think uh, so far we have no epidemiological evidence to suggest that there's been any transmission associated with pets, um, but we don't have a complete answer yet. Okay. Um, uh, the next question, um, people were interested in the statistic that 40% of the patients in the hospital were under 40 years old in Philadelphia. It sounds very different from the rate, in, is the rate different, very different from the rate in New York and maybe discuss that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, we're just starting to collect the data. That's a, a, a number that we shared on a call yesterday amongst critical care providers. Um, we do not know whether this is true throughout Pennsylvania. Uh, we don't know whether this is going to be how the epidemic unfolds. We don't know yet whether this is because transmission has been more robust in the younger age group. Perhaps um, older people have been uh, socially distancing for longer. We don't know whether this is how things are going to play out as the epidemic unfolds. But cool. I, the reason that I made that point is to emphasize that sometimes you hear in the popular press that younger people are not taking this as seriously as older people. And my point there is that younger people do have to take this as seriously as older people because youth is not protection against severe disease. Thank you. Um, there were a bunch of questions related about immunity that's developed after the infection, um, citing cases in China that where people test negative and then positive again. And related question, how long do, is, is virus shed after being cured, so to speak? And are, are recovering patients safe from recurrence or reinfection? Yeah, those are all great questions. You know, the data that has come out of China has, hasn't um, been subject to deep scrutiny. There are certainly cases that are being described as people who recover um, uh, or test positive, then test negative, then test positive again. We don't know whether, we don't know the validity of that data. We don't know whether these are people who actually got reinfected or these are people who um, had uh, uh, transient negative tests but really were long-term uh, shedders of virus. We don't actually know the answer to um, how long uh, some people can shed virus. We know that for the great majority of people, the amount of virus shedding goes down about a week or two after symptoms develop. But is there a small population that has a long tail and continue to shed virus? We, we, we don't know that. Um, only by doing viral testing and doing these types of studies in patients recovering will we know. Uh, will people who recover be immune to another episode? We don't know for sure, but by our best guess based upon other coronaviruses and SARS-1, uh, we think that's likely to be the case. Um, okay, uh, questions about cofactors. Somebody asked uh, how asthma, is asthma a cofactor in COVID-19 disease? And another person asked, is blood type cofactor in determining who gets infected or how sick somebody gets? Well, let me take the blood factor first. That's a great question. And I think that that really rolls up into the question that uh, is being asked here. Are there genetic factors that determine who has mild versus severe disease? So I think blood type, along with many other genetic factors, are important questions to ask. As far as asthma goes, um, the data that we have suggests that all serious underlying lung diseases, as well as cardiac diseases, and also diabetes and hypertension particularly, are, uh, are important cofactors for uh, more severe disease. <clears throat> okay, several people were interested more about new information about droplets, about drop, droplets being airborne. Could you comment some more on that, on how can take these studies? Yeah, so I, I, I think they're referring to um, uh, a study that came out about a week or so ago that reported, uh, that was then uh, carried in the popular press, that reported that the virus can be airborne and in airborne form, uh, it can last for uh, several hours. And so that raised the concern that um, in addition to droplets, could the virus actually be transmitted in an aerosol form? And, you know, uh, this is an evolving area. 
Um, and uh, we have more to learn about this. What I would say is that Droplet is clearly the um, uh, dominant, by far and away most important means of transmission. We don't have evidence of uh, aerosol transmission other than situations where people are creating high level aerosols. So somebody who is on a ventilator where gas, usually oxygen, uh, big, well, always oxygen, usually oxygen uh, at some percentage higher than uh, uh, normal air is being pumped into the lungs and then released, or certain high flow oxygen delivery devices other than a ventilator, that can actually create high levels of aerosols. So I think the question of whether um, aerosols can contribute marginally in addition to droplet is in, in, in general everyday life, I think can be an open question, but protect yourself against droplet transmission and that's really the way to go. Thank you. Um, would personal masks with a filter pad be just as protective as face masks used in the hospital? And I guess more generally, what types of masks are really protective? Well, you know, masks that are that are generated as personal protective devices meet certain requirements in terms of snugness of fit and in terms of the uh, level of filtration. So there are really two types of masks that we use in the hospital. One is called an N95 mask, which has a much, much more stringent level of filtration, and we use that only for aerosol generating procedures, even in the hospital. Another type of mask is the more general uh, face mask, for example, what's used in uh, the operating room and surgical suites. So um, there certainly out in the community is no need for something like an N95 mask. You're not going to be exposed to high levels of aerosol generation. Um, a face mask uh, that is of PPE quality certainly is ideal. But again, I'm going to say, you know, we really need these face masks for healthcare providers, frontline workers who are being exposed to tens or dozens of infected people up close every day. That's what we need them for. So I really want to discourage the public from, you know, uh, uh, depleting the supply, limited supply available of PPE. Do homemade face masks work? Well, we don't know. To be honest, I would love to see somebody do a study of homemade face masks, um, looking at different types of fabric and determine which one uh, might be best. But I think use common sense and recognize that uh, something that is over your nose and your mouth that's going to catch the droplets that come at the droplets of saliva that come out when you talk, use common sense. And I think that um, uh, it certainly isn't going to hurt and will be uh, perhaps better than nothing. Okay, one more question, um, which a little bit of a different type of question. How can Penn Medicine influence local and state government to take measures to reduce infection? Well, that's a great question. I, I will say that we are working hand in hand with the uh, Philadelphia Department of Public Health. The Department of Public Health has asked for input on a number of different areas, um, and uh, we are working closely with them. I think that the um, clinical and scientific, the, the flow of clinical and scientific knowledge and information back and forth between Penn Medicine clinicians, Penn Medicine uh, researchers, maybe uh, epidemiological more than uh, basic researchers uh, in both directions has, has really been good for both entities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman.